I first saw The Beginner's Guide back when it was released in 2015, and since then, it's reserved a space near the top of my list of psychologically exciting games. Beginner's Guide is first sold to the player as something of a documentary. We're learning about the works of an indie game developer named Coda, as we're guided from minigame, or rather, mini-experience to mini-experience, by the narration given by the developer, Davy Reedon, of Stanley Parable fame. Guide subverts our emotional expectations throughout the game. It starts like a cheery, professional museum tour and becomes a Willy Wonka tunnel of inter- and intrapersonal anxieties. The premise is that Davy would like to share the games of a supposedly reclusive Coda with us, the curious public, to encourage Coda to keep creating and sharing their strange and thought-provoking games with others. But without the player really noticing, it morphs into an art analysis piece, then an amateur stab at psychoanalysis where Reedon guides us through how to assess Coda's mental health through interpreting their games. And finally, the story crescendos into an expression piece for uncomfortable emotional revelations. The evolution of Beginner's Guide is mesmerizing and haunting as we make our way to the end, a witness and participant in it all. After finishing this game, I knew it had given me an important and challenging emotional experience that I needed to pick apart. What I found was that I had learned a lot about myself through this game's analytical lens. True to the theme of screen therapy, I want this review to focus on what we stand to gain from playing The Beginner's Guide, emotionally and psychologically. I won't be analyzing the daring writing choices, the minds of either Reed or Nakoda, or even taking a guess as to whether it's all real or fake, though there's a lot to talk about from those angles. This review will be about what the game does for the player's psyche. The emotional impact of this game is undeniable, but I argue that if we approach Beginner's Guide mindfully, we can learn a lot about soothing our perfectionism with self-compassion and tempered expectations, the necessity of budgeting for our psychological recovery, the nuances of understanding our loneliness, and the paramount skill that we all need consistent practice with, self-knowledge. So something we learn as we're ushered from game to game by Reedon is that some of Coda's games have a common theme, perfectionism. Whether or not Coda really exists or struggles with perfectionism isn't really the point. This is about interpreting the game's themes and how they affect us as players. One strong example of perfectionism in the minigames comes from the game titled Lecture, which is about a lecturer giving very heavy-handed advice about the need to be absolutely perfect and to be perfect effortlessly. When you're in the lecturer's shoes, you see that they're trying to stifle thoughts about their physical and emotional imperfections. Many of us have struggled with perfectionism on some level. We self-evaluate constantly and self-criticize, always fixating on the next project and we rarely feel at home in the present moment. Research suggests that the psychological distress of being a perfectionist is like being on a hamster wheel of revolving high-stakes performance and productivity to feed our bottomless need for self-esteem boosts. While self-esteem from high achievement can soothe our perfectionism for a short time, it's not a very renewable resource that we can rely on. In fact, it can harm our opinions of others and our relationships since self-esteem relies on being seen as above average, meaning those who rely solely on self-esteem for validation and well-being can become very judgmental towards others and lash out, putting others down to protect their egos. Although we live in a self-esteem-obsessed culture, always reassuring each other and ourselves how amazing we are, the best antidote to perfectionism is not self-esteem, but self-compassion. Self-compassion is founded on three principles, self-kindness versus self-judgment, feelings of common humanity versus isolation, and mindfulness versus overthinking. We might recognize some of these struggles in the beginner's guide. Some games focused on isolation, others about self-judgment, and most of it seems steeped in overthinking. We learned from the games and read in Reedon's final revelations just how damaging these habits can be. Playing this game, we might have felt bad for Coda and Reedon, and what we interpreted as a deep need for perfection in them. We wished we could have told them it was okay to not be perfect and to go easy on themselves. We wanted to tell them this because we need to be told something similar. Instead of being told that we're amazing and perfect and beautiful so we feel better with a temporary boost of self-esteem, maybe what will help us is the reassurance, even from ourselves, that we deserve compassion and acceptance, even if we're not always amazing at everything. If we look to learn from the beginner's guide for how to treat our own similar struggles, we can turn to self-compassion. We can learn to accept that we are human, just like everyone else. When we fail to meet expectations, it isn't a catastrophe and we aren't alone. Our troubles are usually much smaller than we think and don't need to consume our minds night and day. And that, surprisingly, good enough really is good enough. 
Similar to self-compassion, we can learn from Beginner's Guide the need to allot time for rest and recovery of psychological resources that we use up to complete our everyday responsibilities and pursue our hobbies. In the machine game, we learn about a machine named Coda that is supposedly responsible for making games and pleasing the content-hungry public. This machine has inexplicably stopped working. There is an intense desperation in this game for the machine to create, or at least to apologize for its rest, but apparently the best punishment is its destruction. We can feel like this towards ourselves sometimes. In work, or school, or family responsibilities, we've accomplished a lot, but eventually we reach a wall. We stop giving and stop creating, and if we're not kind to ourselves, we feel quite angry at our sudden selfish need to rest. We apologize to others and criticize ourselves for being human, but we cannot stay active and productive every moment of the day, no matter what inspirational quotes are thrown at us in our productivity-obsessed culture. But rather than budgeting for recovery for the sake of long-term productivity, it might do us some good to recognize the intrinsic worth of recovery for recovery's sake. Practice mindfulness in not only allowing yourself to rest, but in accepting that rest is not shameful or wrong. This is another show of healthy self-compassion that can benefit our well-being. Another common theme in CODIS games is the feeling of isolation. Most of the games are experiences for a single player. Only a few games have NPCs, and even then they are not fully formed people, but instead mannequin-like placeholders for the ideas of people. A few games, like the theater game, actually seem to focus on feelings of social anxiety. We might even pick up on themes of loneliness from these experiences, a thwarted desire to interact meaningfully with others. If this element of the games meant something to you as it did to me, I think this game offers us consolation about how we aren't alone in our loneliness, so to speak. I was particularly struck by the notes game and the theater game, as I've gone through times where I was not only intensely socially anxious, but also withdrawn. While Reedan's narration invites us to look in Coda's mind, and possibly his own, for themes of loneliness, I think the players best serve to look within at how they relate to this topic. The games challenge us to tinker with our feelings and fears around social connections, giving us good practice to understand ourselves and our motivations better. Which actually leads us to self-knowledge. The Beginner's Guide is a guide, so to speak, for how to overstep bounds and try to analyze an artist's mind from their works. But the final message is that often what we find at the end of our analyses isn't an accurate portrait of the artist, but a murky reflection of ourselves. We wanted to learn more about Coda and decipher their fears and anxieties because we wanted to learn more about how they relate to our fears and anxieties. If you've played or watched this game, look back at how you assessed Reedan or Coda, and you might be struck by how the qualities that you focused on in them are also the qualities that have given you the most trouble. For me, that was loneliness, perfectionism, and recovery, which has inspired my review here. Your experience will be different. However, if you're mindful that your analysis of others is often an analysis of yourself, you stand to gain a lot more from the beginner's guide. You can come out of it understanding yourself better. I tried to keep this in mind as I played, and found myself far more invested in the game when I purposely thought about how I related to Coda's and Reedan's feelings. It became a meaningful, elevating, and validating experience. I came out of it understanding my fears and hopes better because of it. Self-knowledge is crucial for our well-being. The better we understand ourselves, the stronger our self-concept and self-narrative. A lack in self-knowledge can lead to indecisiveness and an inability to communicate our feelings, strained relationships, unnecessarily high expectations, which can all lead to long-lasting stress and anxiety. Knowing ourselves gives us surer footing in our emotional lives and can help keep panic and anxiety at bay when things get tough. However, strengthening our self-knowledge is something we must practice throughout our lives. After all, we're always changing and growing as we age. If we leave ourselves behind, so to speak, we can end up confused and frustrated about our path and meaning in life. In a way, the last sequence of the Beginner's Guide might be telling us that we can learn from Reedan's turmoil and look within to grasp the greater complexities of who we are, our motivations, and our fears in order to find peace. A daunting task that this game itself could be a uniquely useful tool for accomplishing. Thank you so much for watching. Playing the Beginner's Guide was really important to me, and I'm really glad that I got to share it with everyone on this channel. If you have any suggestions for other psychologically interesting or exciting games, please leave them in the comments. Also, be sure to subscribe for more content about media psychology, games, and well-being. Thank you, and as always, happy playing.